Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explain, we're looking at Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak. In the aftermath of a family tragedy, an aspiring author is torn between love for her childhood friend and the temptation of a mysterious outsider. Trying to escape the ghost of the past, she is swept away into a house that breathes, bleeds, and remembers. Of all of del Toro's works, this perhaps feels the most beholden to his own particular taste in film, as Crimson Peak acts as an updated take on the classic gothic horror setup influenced by things like The Innocents and The Haunting, but also the UK Hammer films, with our lead Edith Cushing being named after the legendary Peter Cushing. The homages are clear throughout, and just like Del Toro, I am a massive fan. For some reason when this came out, it didn't do that well, and it was perhaps due to it being mismarketed. It was kind of sold as a more traditional spooky thriller, but it's much more of a romantic mystery with some ghosts in there too. You already know that Del Toro makes gorgeous movies, and that is the case here as well, with the Allerdale Hall set being just magnificent and the production design and visuals are incredible. That's just the way Del Toro does it. It's also helped by very strong performances from our main trio, as well as a deepening and disturbing mystery that Edith uncovers regarding her new beau. There is some potential confusion with how things play out, as well as some questions we are left with in the end. And that's why we are here today. So let's check out Crimson Peak, breaking down the story, including the important mysteries at the forefront, how spirits work in this universe, as well as explaining the ending what it means. In a blustery snowstorm, Edith looks troubled, a slash on her face and blood covering her hands. She narrates that ghosts are real and she saw proof for the first time when she was 10 years old. Cholera took her mother and due to this she had a closed casket funeral, thusly no parting kisses, no goodbye. That is until the night she came back. Little Edith is wide awake in bed and the ticking clock suddenly stops. The door creaks open and she looks down the hall as black fingers emerge in shadow. A wispy spirit starts floating right towards her. She turns away and it gently places a hand on her shoulder and croaks that when the time comes, beware of Crimson Peak. Edith shrieks and the spirit vanishes. Sally asks ghosts are real as she has experienced herself, but it's also worth pointing out that it didn't try to scare her or harm her. It actually warned her of impending danger. Edith lived her life without understanding her mother's words and by the time it all made sense to her, it was too late. We pick up in the bustling industrial square of Buffalo, New York 14 years later. She runs into an old friend and Alan, who happens to be setting up his practice upstairs in the same building where she is meeting with a publisher. They're joined by Alan's mother and some other ladies who are all abuzz about a dashing new mystery man who is here on business. His mom boasts that he's an aristocrat of sorts, which Edith pokes holes into, saying, oh, so he feeds off the land that the others work for him. He's more akin to a parasite with a title, she says, and the ladies all gasp in shock. Alan's mother says he's quite charming and a magnificent dancer, which does not concern her. As her mom calls her, our own little Jane Austen. Edith corrects she'd rather be Mary Shelley, as she died a widow, she says, before excusing herself. Oh, you are not like the other girls, are you, Edith? The publisher reads over her manuscript and sighs. Oh, it's a ghost story. She insists that it's not. It's a story with ghosts in it. Ghosts are a metaphor for the past, and this also perfectly encapsulates our own story unfolding here. The publisher does compliment her dainty handwriting, but suggests that she injects some romance into the story. She's annoyed at the rejection, discussing it with her father, but as he points out, everyone falls in love, even women, you know? He hands her a gift, understanding you need the right tools for the job, and it's a fancy pen. She then gets an idea. It was her feminine handwriting that gave her away, and with his help, she is able to get a typewriter to recopy the book. As she clacks away, the aforementioned Sir Thomas Sharp enters, here for a meeting with her dad. He notices the book, and he's immediately intrigued. Whoever wrote it must be quite good, right? She reveals that she's the author, and he reads more about the ghosts. Her reiterating, they're just a metaphor, right? But he's not put off by it. In fact, he has always found them fascinating. Where he's from, ghosts are not meant to be taken lightly. Thomas does his presentation for Mr. Cushing and his partners, learning that his family's business is in scarlet clay. He touts its value in liquid form, which can be made into ore and is so malleable, it can also produce incredibly strong bricks and tiles. Their issue is that overmining has caused most of their mines to collapse, but he has a solution, showing off a scale model of a new kind of harvester of his own design. Carver calls out his bombast. He hasn't even made a full-size machine, so all he has is a toy and some fancy words. He also looked into Sharp's previous attempts to secure financing, rattling off several other cities where he failed. He lays out why exactly he doesn't respect him. He, along with his pals, came up through honest hard work, the kind that leaves a man with rough hands. But Sharp, as he notes, has the smoothest hands he's ever felt. Smooth little baby boy. In America, we bank on effort, not privilege, he declares. Huh, 
that's a nice thought at least. Having eavesdropped on the meeting, Edith wonders if Sharp's plan was really that bad, but Carter corrects that it's the man that he doesn't like. Edith is a bit more sympathetic, pointing out his nice yet dated clothes, calling him merely a dreamer facing defeat. He brings up that Alan is picking him up, and he always had a fondness for her. When he shows up, Alan compliments her attire, beaming that she should be the belle of the ball, but she is not into the social scene. Home alone, she has another encounter with her mother's spirit as the door handle begins to rattle. It swings open, the handle still violently twisting, and she tiptoes closer. Just about to grab it, it rattles, startling her. Out in the hall, the black ghost returns. She shrieks, and Edith slams the door, putting up her ear to listen. The spirit rips right through the door, emitting a dark energy, and reminds her of the childhood warning, beware of Crimson Peak. The substance lingers briefly on the door, and the illusion is shattered when a maid enters, informing her of a surprise guest, Mr. Sharp. He is also heading to the same reception as her father, and he pleads with her for her assistance. He admits that one area that he fails at is speaking American, and after some deliberation, she does decide to tag along after all. At the ball, a woman in a striking red dress slays it on the piano to a captive audience. The spotlight quickly shifts when Edith and Sharp enter, and here they respectively meet Alan and Thomas's sister, Lucille. Alan's mom had been trying to pawn off her daughter on Thomas, but it's obvious who he has eyes for. She calls for a demonstration of the waltz, and to everyone's shock, he selects Edith as his partner. I do declare. He describes that it's all about simplicity and elegance, and if they are true waltz pros, they can do the entire dance without extinguishing a candle flame. They impressively manage to keep it alight, Eunice and the others watching on flabbergasted. Well, I do say, puppycock. They burst into applause, and Lucille looks perturbed, rushing away from the crowd. Her dad, also not a fan of the pairing, sporting quite a sourpuss. Carver clearly doesn't trust the man, and hires some goons to look into finding out more about the Sharps. Edith reconnects with Alan, who shows off some real, genuine spirit photography that he picked up in London. Its silver creates a latent image, and the belief is that due to a chemical compound in Earth or minerals, they can contain impressions of a person no longer living, although not everyone can see them. Referring to a colorblind patient of his, they are unable to see red or green, and only accepts their existence because everyone else does. Thusly, she considers that perhaps they only show up when it's time to see them, just like her mother. She's surprised to learn about his little hobby. Alan shrugging, she never gave him a chance. He's also cautious here regarding the Sharp family, but Edith is confident. He's been gone a long time, and she's been just fine on her own. In the park, Thomas raves about her book and goes to finish reading, leaving her to get to know his sister a bit better. Guess what? She's a weirdo. She's playing around with butterflies, which they don't have at their house, only black moths. They're formidable, but lacking beauty, and thrive on the dark and cold. Their preferred diet? Butterflies, I'm afraid. She places one down, and a colony of ants swarm the bug, munching it to death. Basically, Lucille is a black moth, and Edith is the fragile, beautiful butterfly. On their own, we start uncovering more about the siblings' desperate situation. Lucille scowls that she's a bad choice, and too young, but Thomas has explained the setup, and he needs a ring. She is not happy about it, groaning that she hopes he's successful, it's the last thing they have to sell. He clarifies they're not selling anything, but indeed buying something with it, meaning Edith herself. He's buying a wife, and they're clearly intending to manipulate her assets to save themselves. So Thomas isn't such a good dude after all, and Carver finds out even more from his cronies. He then requests a private meeting with the siblings, and as seems to be his style, he gets right to the point. Thomas has been spending time with his daughter, and he's not pleased, mixing business with pleasure and all. He wasn't sure why he didn't like Sharp upon meeting him, but now he knows why, showing off the files. He makes them a simple proposition. The two of them leave first thing in the morning, and he'll give them a fat check to go away and never come back again. The final caveat is that before departing, Thomas must break Edith's heart. He gives a heartwarming farewell to the group, and Edith is upset at the news, stomping off. He confronts her and acts extra cold, saying there's nothing keeping them here. As the crowd gathers, he goes for the jugular, calling her book a bunch of naive nonsense. She obviously has never actually lived at all. There's a kind of connection between her book's characters and Thomas himself, spitting is that what you dream of? A kind man, a pure soul, meant to be redeemed. The fantasy he has concocted is actually Thomas, as we will start to see. Not a great dude, but pure at heart and in need of some good old redemption. It looks like that's all she wrote for the siblings, but things won't be as simple as Carver intended. Back at his bathhouse, he's drawn away by clanging in the lockers. When he returns, the sink is overflowing. He leans down to grab his razor, and someone donned in black gloves appears behind him and bashes his head onto the sink. They keep bonking it until the sink shatters, leaving him in a bloody mangled heap. Ah, that's interesting. The one person that knew the truth about the Sharps winds up mysteriously murdered the very next day? Who could be responsible? Things aren't so simple regarding
regarding Thomas's feelings either, as Edith is awoken to a letter left behind from him. It explains all about her father's plan that he went along with, and at the news, she rushes to find him. She gets their hotel room number, but by the time she's arrived, they are long gone, having caught the morning train. She's more than a bit heartbroken, yet to her surprise, finds Thomas has returned to her after all. He fawns that he cannot leave her, as she is all that occupies his mind, feeling there is a link between their hearts. Well, looks like his feelings were true, and they share a romantic kiss. But the moment is later soured when Edith is given word of her father's death. She is obliged to ID the body, and Alan also lends a hand to investigate things. Edith breaks down at the sight and refuses to accept her father's death, leaning right into Thomas's arms for comfort. At his funeral, she is now wearing his red ring, indicating that the couple are now engaged. Hey, things turned out okay for Thomas after all. Almost like this is exactly what they wanted to happen. So it's off to move into his estate at Allerdale Hall, off in remote England, surrounded by red clay. An older employee greets them, and Thomas introduces his wife, to which the guy strangely replies, I know, sure you've been married a while now. Hmm, is that supposed to mean? A random dog then shows up, which Thomas claims to have no idea about, but does allow her to keep it. He carries her romantically over the threshold as she takes in the grand main entry of the house, impressive in size, but now appearing rundown and derelict. There's even a huge hole in the ceiling, allowing snow to drift inside. She sighs it's even colder in here than outside, and he explains that the problem is unavoidable erosion. The mine is right below the house, causing the wood to rot. The house is essentially sinking, and as he steps up, we see just how much the clay is invading, splooging up right under his foot. Edith tidies herself up in the mirror, and what looks like her mother's spirit returns, which she assumes is Lucille. She follows the figure, rounding the corner as they take the elevator up. She mentions what she saw to Thomas, but he knows that it wasn't Lucille, it must be the shadows, and warns her to never go down below this level to the mines. It definitely couldn't have been Lucille as she has just returned from town with new parts for Thomas's precious harvester. Edith casually asks for a copy of the house keys, but Lucille shuts her down. There's some dangerous areas in the house. If after you're acclimated, if you want one, let me know, and clutches the keys tight like a prison warden. Edith draws a bath, hearing the pipes groaning in agony before unleashing a red tinged deluge. As for the seemingly random dog, Thomas and Lucille were well aware of it, and he actually let it out into the the cold and assumed that it would have died. Yeah, that's pretty shitty, dude. He offers that they won't have to worry anymore, but as she notes, Edith Money isn't here yet. She still wants to know why it is they chose her, putting a hand tenderly on his chin. Mmm, they are pretty close, huh? Edith attempts to have a nice relaxing bath, and the pooch enters with his ball. She does a few rounds of fetch, but on one toss, the dog doesn't return. Down the hall, a red spirit's arm cracks. She hurries out of the tub, and it approaches her from behind. This must be a different spirit due to the color, also seeing that it's missing its ring finger. They open their mouth and growl. Edith gasps and spins back, seeing that it has already vanished. The dog scampers in, and the ball soon follows after, rolling mysteriously towards her from the other end of the hall. Ghosts like playing fetch, everyone knows that. Thomas serves her some tea, confident that it will make her feel better. Based on the face she makes, it's not exactly pleasant tasting, and he groans that nothing gentle grows in these lands. Lucille is obviously jealous of their burgeoning relationship, watching the entire interaction through the keyhole. Edith jolts awake in the morning to Lucille tinkling the ivories, where she gains some more insight into their history. Lucille is playing an old lullaby that she used to sing to Thomas when they were children, and Edith can imagine the idyllic scene. That was not the case, as they were actually confined to the nursery in the attic. They would hear Mother playing through the floor, and this is how they even knew that she was back in the country. There's an imposing portrait of her in the wall, seeing the red ring was initially hers, and Lucille feels it captures her essence well. Quite horrible. There is already quite a strong bond between the siblings, and now we understand where that all comes from. They were basically prisoners when they were kids and only had each other to lean on. Those circumstances of abuse have made their connection even stronger. Back in Buffalo, Alan is helping to liquidate the Cushing family estate. There he stumbles on a clue in Carver's office. The last check stub is made out to Thomas. He then surveys the sink and considers that this could have been the source of the blows to Carver's head. He's starting to figure out the more nefarious side to the Sharp clan. Edith takes the elevator to the top floor finding the black moths Lucille mentioned, along with a mural of the siblings as kids. She then passes by an old rocking chair, and in the sun, we can make out amongst the dust the shape of a person sitting in it. She pays a visit to Thomas's workshop, and he also reveals more about their history. He used to make toys to make his sister happy, and as for their father, he was gone all the time, scoffing. The family fortune didn't lose itself. He activates a silly toy, and she smiles wide. Thomas eyes her and tells her she's different from everyone. They kiss, which gives gets more passionate, and he lifts her on the desk just about to do the deed for the first time. They make a 
clear they haven't been intimate yet. They're stopped by a noise, and it's Lucille arriving with more tea. He practically shoves it down her throat while they both decline. Wonder why that is? They never drink the tea and only Edith does. <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing. She wakes up to her tummy in turmoil, hearing Odd sighing and the dog barking. There's no sign of Thomas, so she grabs a candelabra to scour the halls. Gothic horror style. You gotta have candelabras, it's basically the one check mark. Check. A door creaks open, beckoning her that way. She comes to an area with a glowing red light, and then hears what sounds like the dog being attacked. Yeah, she sees it's just fine right outside. There's a brief flash of a red face behind another door, and there she discovers a wooden box containing wax cylinders. More moans ring out, and the red spirit rises from the ground. It crawls towards her, shrieking and dragging herself forward. She grabs the dog, and the elevator comes to life on its own, sending her on a trip down into the forbidden lower levels. It is certifiably cavey down there, with the clay marking the walls, along with locked up vats throughout the room. Hearing more moaning, she finds a trunk marked with the initials ES, which is, of course, locked. There's even an inscription on the lock. Enola. Hmm, well, that's all quite troubling. She confronts Thomas, busy with his harvester, and asks him straight up if anyone has died in the house. He chuckles, of course, the house is hundreds of years old. Many souls have come and gone. She means violent death specifically, and he excuses that it's not a good time and rushes back to his machine. He puts a hand within the inner workings, and it roars even stronger, but soon sizzles his hand. Thomas goes on to express some serious self-doubts. She married a failure, but she encourages him not to say that. He is all she has. His time to get the harvester running is growing short, as winter will be coming soon, and then she'll really find out why they call it Crimson Peak, in relation to the mixture of snow and red clay. Whoops, she wound up exactly where her mother warned her not to, and we see the realization wash over her face. Alan wants to discuss his concerns with the lawyer, but he thinks all is well for Edith. She's planning on investing all of her assets into Thomas's machine. Well, that's yet another red flag. The siblings obviously orchestrated this to get Edith's money. Alan also finds something strange about her father's death and the impact to his head, as well as that final check. The lawyer confides that before he died, Carver hired Mr. Holly, who dug up some quite unsavory facts on the Sharps. Edith has an odd dream. While standing out in a field, the red spirit points at something ominously. She wakes up coughing and sees she's actually started to hack up blood. Yep, you're being poisoned, lady. She hears the sound of children's voices, and Thomas isn't there with her. So she calls out to the spirit, if you're here, give me a signal. Something whizzes by, knocking her to the ground, and hear the distinct sound of a woman being murdered, followed by children children laughing. She follows the voices into the bathroom, seeing the red spirit in the tub. They also have a big old knife jammed right through their head. They croak to life and get to their feet, and Edith backs away terrified. It moans for her to leave now, even saying her name. She also warns that his blood will be on your hands, which must mean Thomas. She rushes to him and spills what she saw, but of course now there's no one in there. She frantically describes the spirit as having hatred in her eyes as well as intelligence. She even knew who she was, and specifically told her to leave. The siblings excuse she must have been sleepwalking or imagining things. Thinking being cooped up here is the problem, he suggests that they take a trip to the post office. <laughs> well, that sounds like a blast. Edith heaves that she has to leave for good, but Lucille tells her this is her home now. There's nowhere to go. Well, that certainly sounds sinister. Not very welcoming, you know what I mean? The pair are baffled how she knew what happened to their mother, meaning that they must have killed her in the tub as children. They decide that as soon as she signs the papers, they will be taking her out. They venture to the post office, and the employee IDs her as Lady Sharp. He has some letters from her, one from her lawyer and another all the way from Italy. But as she mentioned, she doesn't know anyone that lives there. Hmm. They want to get on the road to beat the storm, but when offered a room for the night, they decide to wait it out. Alan meets with Mr. Holly, who has more dirt on the Sharps. There's a clipping regarding a shocking murder at the manor, again linking them to potentially being responsible. At the time, Holly only had civil-related documents, but he says that was enough to prevent them from getting married. As it shockingly turns out, Thomas already is. Is. Twist! Poor naive Edith, of course, has no idea, as the two are now holed up for the night. He continues reading her book, and he has taken a shining to one character. He wants to know, will he make it out? But according to Edith, it's the characters themselves who decide their fates. She doesn't understand why Thomas won't leave their crumbling estate, and rattles off other cities around the world they can make a fresh start. Ending with Milan. He's taken aback at the invention, and does say that he's been there once before, proceeding to stare off in his face. Like, I don't want to talk about Italy. 
Ashley. Uh... She chides him for always looking to the past. She's not there, she's right here. He agrees that he is here too. And things start getting steamy again. And they are finally able to consummate the marriage with no sister shoving tea down their throats every five minutes. Once more, her book presents Thomas's challenge as a person. It's up to the character to make their own choice. And she is trying to pull him out of his past to move on with his life. That's the kind of power dynamic developing between Edith and his sister. We start understanding the depth of this when they return home. Lucille is shocked shocked and horrified to learn that they slept together in a room. She knows what probably happened. It seems part of the plan is to keep Edith at arm length, so giving them the chance to get together has pulled Thomas closer to Edith. Lucille loses her shit and tosses out her breakfast, crying that she can't be left alone and was worried sick. Edith is suddenly feeling faint, and there's only one solution as Lucille knows. More tea, please! Edith notices amongst her massive keyring, one marked Enola, matching the trunk from downstairs. She reads a letter from her lawyer. All she has to do to complete the final transfer is sign on the document enclosed. Just about to sign it, she remembers that other strange letter from Milan. It's addressed to Enola, and now she gets the confusion. The post office guy thought Edith was Enola, and she must be Thomas's previous wife. She switches gears to try the key she snatched onto the steam trunk, and yep, it opens right up. Inside, there's a gramophone and several envelopes marked with several cities, the very same ones that her dad mentioned where Thomas had previously tried and failed to gain funding. Well, I think we can figure out for sure sure what's been going on here. Thomas has been traveling to various cities in order to pump more money into the crumbling estate and its dumb minds. When he fails to do so, he instead seeks a wife, any way to make money and save the family's name. Then of course, when they secure the funds, it's Bye bye, wifey. Edith hears some clanging in one of the clay pits, and after cracking off the lock, exposes a pool of shimmering red liquid. She sticks a pole in there and stirs it around, yet nothing turns up. However, soon after, a skeleton bubbles to the surface. Looks like this is where they dumped Enola's body and why her spirit was red. Now, word from today's sponsor HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. There's one question we can all relate to what's for dinner? Luckily, HelloFresh is a convenient way to get meals delivered straight to your door. Go to HelloFresh.com slash foundflix16 and use code foundflix16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. There's a lot of advantages to using their service, such as it cutting out all the time and stress it takes to meal plan or go to the store for all your ingredients. HelloFresh comes pre-portioned with everything you need for an exciting and flavorful meal that's definitely cheaper than going out. Some people might not think that they have time to cook, but HelloFresh makes it super easy and approachable with recipe cards including simple step-by-step -step instructions and pictures. It's pretty much a no-brainer. I love to cook and also love how much variety there is in HelloFresh's many different meal offerings, boasting 50 options a week. So why not give HelloFresh a try and see how great it is for yourself? Go to HelloFresh.com slash FoundFlix16 and use code FoundFlix16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Tom comes in all excited, thinking he's finally gotten the harvester up and running. He just needs a bit more coal along with Lucille's keys. She jangles through them and notices the missing one. So she sets out in search of Edith, who prances just out of her sight and stuffs her evidence under the couch. She quickly takes a seat and uses a blanket to cover her red-stained dress and pretends to look ill. Based on this, it looks like Edith couldn't have taken the key and all is well. Well, sort of. She asks Lucille to fetch her some water and this gives her a perfect opportunity to replace the key unnoticed. Or perhaps not, Lucille unconvincingly tells her she'll be feeling better soon and when retrieving her keys, notices the Enola one has returned. Now she definitely knows something fishy is going on here. Edith later gets those wax cylinders cranked up and a woman Pamela says hello. She's doing a test for her beloved Thomas in 1887. She requests for him to speak into the horn and he stammers, I'd rather not. There's photos of them together and they were definitely a couple. Then there's another woman looking weak in a wheelchair, probably from pesky poison tea. Then there's Enola who sounds desperate and weak. She said she had plans to leave but was unable to, crying out all they want is money for their infernal machine. So yep, she's for sure also being poisoned, even seeing the tea set out in the photo. Let it be known they did this, she coughs, and she keeps rifling through things. She's shocked to find a baby photo, and tragically it appeared to not live for very long. Pamela then continues about her tea being poisoned, and right on cue, Edith coughs up blood, now terrified that she will suffer the same fate of his previous wives. She attempts to flee, but that will prove difficult thanks to the storm howling outside, and she grows weak, collapsing on the stairs. She regains consciousness to Lucille tending to her bed. How about some tea are literally the first words out of her mouth, which 
Edith now knows who refuse. In that case, you have to eat, and she jams some pores down her throat. She reminisces that she took care of her mother in this very bed. Father broke her leg, and it never quite healed right, so she was bedridden for some time. But I cared for her, she smiles, fed her, bathed her, and combed her hair. I made her better, she boasts, and I'll do the same for you. Uh, no, no thanks anyway, Lucille. I know what you think make better means. Thomas enters and appears to have reached his limit, barking for her to never drink the tea ever again. The siblings' problems are mounting with her knowing what's going on here, and Lucille thinks the only way is to kill her, as the alternative is that they get caught, she'll be put into an institution, and he'll be hanged. She starts their sibling motto, apparently, we stay together, which he completes never apart. Wow, these two are really close, huh? It also really feels like Lucille is the one leading things here. She knows that he'll never leave her. I can't, he agrees wistfully, and she's satisfied as she more or less has trapped him in this toxic situation, which we still don't know the full extent of yet. Alan's heroic quest brings him to the post office and asks for directions to the house, yet there's some issues standing in his way. There's no horses and, of course, the big-ass storm. It could take up to four hours on foot. He's undeterred, retorting in that case he better get going and sets off into the blizzard. Edith idly sits in the wheelchair, facing the quite pokey dark hallway. She's surprised hearing a baby screaming, and floating in the air in the main room is the red spirit along with a red baby. Edith understands now that this must be Enola and asks what it is that she wants. She points her long red fingers in a direction that Edith follows. She comes to the nursery and the black moss, hearing Lucille singing on the other side of the door. As she sees them, Edith is horrified at what she witnesses. Seeing she is, um, giving Thomas a hand, he faces her looking ashamed, Edith backing up, unable to even process what she's seeing. She rushes to the elevator, and Lucille chases after her to lay it all out. She sees that she knew that she wasn't really her sister, but Lucille makes it 100% clear she actually is gross. This adds a whole other uncomfortable layer to the siblings' relationship. Like, we knew it was fucked up, but this is some next level shit. The point being, they are both very damaged individuals, and that's where all of their stuff originated. Alan arrives and pounds on the front door, and fearing what might happen, Lucille pushes Edith over the railing, sending her crashing down onto the snowy floor. This time, she comes to at least being treated by Alan and not Lucille, her and her bro looking quite nervous. Edith brings up the Crimson Peak warning from her mother, and he spots some telltale crusting on her finger. Oh, and hey, Alan, you know, you had a long trip up in the cold. How about some, I don't know, poison tea? He is already wise enough to turn it down, and Lucille grabs his arm, inviting him to stay the night. I mean, the storm and everything, it's a mess out there. We're definitely not gonna kill you both. Again, luckily, Alan ain't no dum-dum, and asks for a moment alone with his patient. He reveals his true plan is to get her out of here, but his rescue is short-lived when the others catch him in the main hall. Alan explains that he needs to get her to a hospital, and they attempt to disagree. He's all, yes, she does, because you've been poisoning her. I know what's going on here. He knows even more than that, and hands over the article on the murder. He details all about how Lady Sharp was murdered in the tub, one axe blow that almost split her head in two. There were no suspects, because the only people in the house at the time were the children. This was too tragic for the public to even consider, so they were sent their separate ways. Thomas to boarding school, and Lucille to an institution, he presumes. The secrets continue to unravel, with Alan confirming he is married to Enola, and Edith lists off his previous wife's names as well. He feebly tries to defend himself, but Alan has heard enough. They're leaving. Lucille can't have that, and stabs him right in the armpit. Hmm, strange choice. He stumbles, breathing heavily, and yanks out the blade. He struggles to keep going, and opens up the front door. Lucille orders Thomas to take care of him, but once again, it appears Thomas is changing his ways. He tells Alan secretly it's either going to be her or him, and since he's a doctor, can he point him in a safe place to stab him? Alan guides his trajectory to a spot on his torso, and he jabs him right in the gut. Edith shouts out in anguish for her pal, sobbing they're both monsters. Lucille smirks, that's funny, that's the last thing Mother said to us. It looks like Thomas's change of heart has stuck for good, and he wants to help the doctor survive. He knows Lucille is going to force Edith to sign the documents and then kill her, sending him down to escape through the mines. Things are just as Thomas assumed, with Lucille holding Edith at knife point for her to sign those dang papers, and is also burning her book in disdain. She feels no remorse for any of the previous killings, as they were all carefully selected. They had money and dreams, but no family, no one to come looking for them, so she feels it's more like mercy killings. Well, then what about Enola's baby? But Thomas never actually slept with any of his previous wives, so it turns out the baby was hers. Wow, well, now we get why she was so jealous when they spent the night together. He probably hasn't actually been intimate with anyone except his sister. Hmm, man, this pair is pretty twisted. As she says, the baby was born wrong, and she wanted to destroy it at birth, but it was Enola who was hopeful that she could save it, which didn't work out, obviously. Edith wants to know, what's the point of all this 
horror. For money and to save the family name, sure, the marriages were for money, but she was fueled by love, a kind that burns, maims, and twists you inside out. It's a monstrous love that makes monsters of us all. She longingly recalls her childhood. In order to protect Thomas, she would take all the beatings from their mother. Things went south when she discovered their forbidden love, the only thing they ever knew in these rotting walls. Edith doesn't believe that it's love, but more like she's suffocating him. She's tired of the chit chat and barks for her to sign her bloody name. She does as asked, although another question remains, who killed her father? We're led to think it was Thomas, but it was actually Lucille who did the deed. Edith wheels the pen, appropriately the one that her father gifted her, right into Lucille's chest. She scurries to the elevator just as Thomas is riding up. He attempts to explain things, but she is no longer interested after all the lies and poisonings. He knows what he did was wrong, but his feelings were real. He asks her to trust him one last time and runs off vowing that he's going to finish this. He does make a bold stand in defiance of his sister, tossing the financial documents in the fire and proclaims, she will live. Lucille is baffled at him ordering her around for a change, and he tries to convince her that they can leave and start a new life, finally moving on from their name and the mine. They can be free. They can all be together, he offers, but she doesn't like the sound of Edith around and shirks back from his touch. She's heartbroken, as he promised he wouldn't ever fall in love. He knows what he said, but well, it has happened. She can't handle him having affections for another and stabs him a few times. He croaks her name and she pokes the blade right into his cheek. He then pulls it out and she rushes to his side, now realizing what she's done. He grows weak and slumps over, Lucille a bundle of emotions, weeping and taking his body in her arms. Lucille then sets her sights on Edith, the pair having a chase across the floors. She searches for a suitable weapon and Lucille almost gets her. She runs into the elevator and uses the cage to keep her at bay. She slices at her finger and Lucille gets her with a swipe in the face. Edith sends the elevator down to the mine level, Lucille still in hot pursuit. Alan is still alive at least, but he's gotta hide. She's coming! Lucille enters, the room appearing empty, and she pulls up a tile, calling out that before she was put away, she kept a little souvenir and unwraps the massive cleaver used to kill her mama. Edith isn't afraid and grabs her knife, stepping out ready for battle. Lucille fakes her out a few times before barreling right at her. She ascends the machine, coming out at ground level. She takes cover behind the harvester as Lucille makes it out. It's hard to make out anything in the storm, Edith scanning the area. Lucille gets a sneak attack in on her, and she runs off, kicking the machine to life. Now she can't hear anything either. Lucille surprises her from behind, and she stops the axe blow as Lucille grabs her knife. She growls that she won't stop until one of them is dead. Edith shouts out for help, her adversary scoffing, there's no one here to help you. Yes, there is, she declares, and she spins around to her brother's spirit. The distraction allows Edith to whap her with the shovel, and Lorraine repeats about her not giving up. So Edith brains her, saying, I heard you the first time. She approaches the ghostly Thomas and is able to nearly caress his face, but it is not tangible. Blood spills from his face wound, and he disappears in, um, spirit particles? She begins to narrate, circling us back to the beginning. Ghosts are real, this much I know. She and Alan then make their way out of Allerdale, as a group of backup is there to rescue them. She continues on about the spirits. Things tie them to a place, tethered to a patch of land or spilling of blood, a terrible crime. But then there are other spirits that hold on to emotions as we float through the empty house. They are driven by loss and revenge, or love, she says, as we come around to the piano, seeing Lucille's dark spirit there playing. Those spirits never go away. Now, I've seen several incarnations of spirits throughout, but the main thing is, despite being pretty spooky looking, they are not malicious. They're actually trying to help. If Edith had split when she first figured out the whole Crimson Peak thing, things would have turned out a lot differently. But who's gonna believe some ghosts, you know? You'd probably think you were just going nuts. Life lesson there, always trust ghosts. They will not steer you wrong. That's not even mean. It's like spirits stick around the mortal plane for a specific purpose. With her mom, it was to warn her about Crimson Peak, and for Enola, it was to guide her to expose what happened to her and the Sharps' whole past. Which takes us to the siblings and their respective fates. Just as Thomas ridiculed earlier in Edith's story, she's seemingly searching for a bad boy that needs redemption. It all comes down to the character's choices to determine their fate, and even though he did do a bunch of bad stuff, Thomas ultimately changed his tune due to love. That's why after their moment, he fades away. His soul is at peace. He's free. The same can't be said for her sister. As Edith describes, she is a different kind of spirit, one fueled by loss and love. Those stick around forever. Meaning unlike her brother, Lucille is doomed to haunt the halls of Arendelle Hall for eternity. Her soul will never be at peace. She is effectively stuck to the past forever. With that, we've reached a conclusion for this ending explained on Crimson Peak. Don't forget, before we go, you can send me your 
requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Crimson Peak and its ending? What's your favorite Del Toro flick? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.